So this evening we're just we have to speak on the different stages of development of bhakti stages of devotion. These stages are described for us in the second chapter of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, beginning verse number 13, which describes about faith. But actually, even before faith takes place, there has to be some association with devotees because it's through the devotees somehow that we develop that faith, that we have any kind of faith at all. There has to be something with devotees somewhere. Without having that contact with the devotees, how will you have any faith? So, somehow, we've developed some faith in process of Krishna consciousness. And that faith is something which is there all the way through in devotional service. 
we have to have faith. Faith should become stronger and stronger. Weak faith is the sign of Kanish, the junior devotee. Someone has weak faith, they can easily be encouraged in the activities of devotional service. You know, people will talk to you and say, oh, vegetarian. You know, that's, they will convince you that being a vegetarian is not good for you. And <laughs> there, there are people think like that. You know, there are many people in the world thinking, don't eat. Do you eat? <laughs> Some people say like that. They wonder how to live. You don't eat meat. Do you eat? They're, they're surprised. They don't understand that. Of course, not everyone fully appreciates the variety of foodstuffs that are there in the vegetarian diet. Some people in the world, they think that if you're a vegetarian, means you just eat rice and some green leaves. <laughs> they think that's what being a vegetarian means. They don't understand so many different grains and beans and vegetables which we can use and combine with different spices we can produce so many different foodstuffs. But somebody who is weak in faith, you know, then they can be convinced, you know, oh, this is not, not right. And if you tell people, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning, what? <laughs> what do you do at that time, you know? <laughs> I... I was in, in China once, and uh, in China, I, I spent some time on a, a university campus. And they, in China, they have hostels for all the students. They stay on the campus. So they play uh, the national anthem every morning, six o'clock in the morning, you know? And the idea is wake everybody up, you know? So, I was talking to someone and they asked, you know, what time do you wake up in the morning? I said, oh, six o'clock, you know. I didn't want to tell them anything extreme. But when I said six o'clock, they said, what? <laughs> they were so shocked. Really? You get up at six o'clock in the morning? They thought it was so early because although they play the national anthem all over the campus, None of the students get up. <laughs> they just roll over, you know. <laughs> they don't get up. <laughs> so, the, you know, you sleep early, you get up early. There's a saying, you know, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy. And Prabhupada said, yes, it's, a, it's true. You know, if, if you have that kind of routine to sleep earlier, not to stay up all night, you know, watching Bollywood movies and gambling and doing all these different things, but if you get into a routine where you can sleep earlier in the night and wake up early in the morning, it's actually very healthy. It's very good for us. Of course, you have to know how to use the morning hours. One man told me he woke up in the morning, turned on the television. <laughs> he said, well, that's not quite the purpose of waking up early in the morning. Anyway, some people, like, we, as devotees, we know, we understand these kind of principles. But it's 
difficult for, as we were hearing this morning, um, His Grace Chaitanya Chaturbha was explaining so nicely about uh, insiders and outsiders, right? So people who are outsiders, for them it's really hard to swallow, you know, the the things which are part of our life, our lifestyle is just difficult for so difficult for them to understand and to accept. What we think to be perfectly normal, something so strange, you know. You're, are you some kind of cult or some sect or something? They think like that, you see. They don't understand. Actually, this is the original, this is tr the, the way things used to be in the, in the ancient, in the times of the ancient, in the ancient past. People lived that kind of life. They didn't stay up all night watching movies. They didn't have televisions and things. People lived in a very different way. So when we try to explain to people some of these things, then it, it can be very hard for them to swallow. They think, wow, you know, it's so strange, you know. And, and, and they can discourage you. You can lose your faith. You have, if we have weak faith, then we lose that, you know, we become very disturbed and we think, oh, maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe I should be like other people. Maybe I should, maybe I have to eat meat. <laughs> like people get influenced easily if the faith is weak. So faith is important, and faith is one of the parameters for judging the person who is kanista and madhyam and uttam, according to faith and their knowledge. Generally, that's a criterion to establish the different levels of devotees. So faith is described as the beginning of the devotional process. First one should have faith. And we get that faith by hearing from the from scriptures, reading one of the books. Maybe you get a book. I got a book and I read the book and I was very impressed. It certainly had an impact on me. And I immediately started to chant. Hare. Well I you know, I knew about the chanting before because when the devotees came to the of George Harrison, the Hare Krishna Mantra, was played it. And so I was also chanting, singing, but I had no idea what everything is, what it is. But some of that gave the seed, put the seed in me later on that brought me to come and finally meet the devotees. After I read the book, then it was very helpful for me. And then I knew I had to go to the temple and go to the center there, the other center. So I went there and began association. So that was the beginning of faith. Faith to start chanting Hare Krishna. That's how Prabhupada describes the beginning of Krishna consciousness when you start to chant the Maha Mantra. And it said, Lord Chaitanya said, anybody who chants even one time, he should be considered a devotee. There was a discussion, this one devotee, uh, He'd come to Jag he'd come to Rathiatra at Jagannath Puri, and he met with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he said to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he said, "I'm very fallen. I'm in the householder life. How can I make advancement?" So Lord Chaitanya told him, "You have to chant the Maha Mantra, and you have to also serve the devotees." So then he asked. How can I recognize who's a devotee? Because 
you could understand it's not just external symbols. It's not just putting on a heavy tea lag, big neck beads. It's not just wearing a dhoti and having a big neck. You know, how to recognize who's a devotee? The Lord Chaitanya said, anyone who chants the holy name, even one time, you should consider him a devotee. Sometimes when I tell people that they're oh they're very oh they're very pleased, they're very happy. They think, oh good, I only need to chant one time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a devotee. They were telling me I have to chant sixteen rounds. The man tonight is saying you only need to chant one time and you're a devotee. <laughs> so of course it's not like that. You chant one time, that's the beginning, but you have to go on from there. You have to continue to chant. That's what, what the first chanting, that's the, the initiation, the beginning. You start to chant the holy name, but we should go on from there. And indeed, the man came back again the next year and he asked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again, how, how to recognize and this time Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said something different. He said, one who chants the holy name constantly, he's a devotee. But then the next year again, again the man came back. And again he asked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu the same question. How to recognize a devotee? And this time Mahaprabhu said, that person simply by seeing him, makes other people chant Hare Krishna Mantra is a devotee. Try to understand there's different levels of devotees, right? Just like I was saying, Kanista, Madhyam, Uttama. There's different levels of devotee. Someone's began to chant. They just began to chant. Someone else is chanting regularly. And someone else it makes other people chant. Just by his presence, he can inspire other people to chant Hare Krishna. So faith is a very important commodity. We do want to cultivate our faith. And we want to make faith strong. We don't want to just have weak faith. We want to strengthen that faith. And we do it, just like you're coming here for several days, so you get a lot of more faith in Krishna consciousness. My faith increased greatly when I started going to the temple and just being with the devotees. Association is so important because they had faith and they gave me a lot of faith. I saw them and I got faith from them. So faith is the first step in Krishna consciousness. And then we have to go on to sadhu sangha, the association. Not just sporadically, but regularly associating with devotees. Regularly coming in contact with devotees hearing from them. Of course, you can make use of mobile work. You can go online and hear classes and so on. But it's not as good as personally being in the presence of the devotee. Personal presence is more powerful. Gaur Govinda Maharaj was a very great elevated devotee. He was a disciple, my god brother, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And he used to tell his disciples that just hearing recordings is not enough. You have to be in the presence of the devotee. He wanted the devotees to be present because then he would slap their face. <laughs> he would wake them up. <laughs> he wouldn't let them go to you keep them on their toes, you know, and, and that is the big difference, you know. You've got to hold his attention, and that's required. When you're at home, 
you know, you lay back, you turn on, you, yeah, I'm in the class, you know. Some people go to party like that, you know, they're laying on the bed and, oh, mom, party, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> An online mom party. <laughs> and you're on bed. On, on. So it's not quite the same. And it's important, take that association, physical presence, very powerful, very important. That is real sadhu sangha. We say lava matra to sangha, get perfection. Lava matra, one eleven second, very brief association, but it can give all perfection. But very powerful. Not only uh, just for an one eleven second, we much association we can get. We should, for that association, like all of you, I see you have a lot of greed that you come here and maybe you're accepting conditions which are not quite nothing equal to what you're used to. Maybe it's, you know, more difficult, more simple. You have that greed because you have that strong desire to associate Therefore, you've come here and you're spending your time to be with the devotees. So greed is a sign of our faith that we want something very badly, right? <laughs> you really want it. And Prabhupada coined the phrase of Krishna consciousness, the verse. There's a Sanskrit verse like that, which says that. Uh, you cannot purchase, you can, to get Krishna consciousness, you have to pay the price. Now, of course, in India, we're accustomed to, come right? You know, you want to buy something and you'll ask them, what's the cheapest price you'll give me? They'll say, you know, whenever I go foreign country, I always find out what's it, how to say. <laughs> I say, Lord, <laughs> if, I, if I'm in Hong Kong, Indian, it's all different language to say, I want it cheaper, you know, I want, I want the cheapest price. What's the cheapest price? But Sanskrit sloka said, there's only one price. Only one. And the price you have to pay, it, the intense desire to achieve it, that kind of greed, that's very important. That I really want, I'm really in focus, that this is what I want, to become Krishna conscious. So that's the price which you have to pay to get love of Krishna. We have to cultivate that kind of desire. How can you know, they have to have strong faith and we have to have good association. We want to associate with people who are also thinking in a similar manner. We, we, we reflect the qualities of people. With. I remember being at college that to associate people The word very well on the exam make the people and it's consciousness want to associate we have to recognize the levels of devotees. So we see like that in nectar of instruction. 
Rupa Goswami has described. He said, uh, one should mentally honor a devotee who chants the holy name. One should offer obeisances to a person who has undergone spiritual initiation and is engaged in worshiping the deity. And one should associate with and faithfully serve that devotee who is fixed in undeviating devotional service and is freed from the propensity to criticize others. So in this way, Rupa Goswami describes how we can distinguish devotees and what kind of devotee to associate with, how to associate these different devotees. Right? You, a devotee is just chanting the holy name. We respect them in the mind. Someone else is worshipping the deity. They're initiated and they're on the altar. We will offer our obeisances to them. And somebody else is the, the devotee who is fixed in deviating devotional. We want to associate with and serve that person. So Sadhu Sangha comes after faith. You see, Adao Shraddha Tata Sadhu Sangha. In the beginning, faith. And that faith brings us to associate with devotees. Sadhu Sangha. And in the association of devotees, we come to Bhajana Kriya. Bhajana Kriya. Engage. You know, you associate with devotees. Oh, devotees, they're all wearing neck. I better get some neck beads. Oh, devotees all got a bead bag. I better get a bead bag. I get some japa mala. You know, and devotees have chant. Oh, okay, I have to chant japa. I better sit and chant with them. You start to do bhajana kriya. I remember I went to the temple in London and uh, I was coming. It was a weekend, I think. And I came to the temple. And the devotee said to me, he said, they were cleaning the temple today. He said, can you help? He said, and then he looked at me, he said, you know, cleaning the temple is cleaning your heart. So I thought, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, I thought, yeah, I have a dirty heart. I'd better get in there and do some cleaning. So that was how he introduced me to doing temple seva that it's not ordinary, but it's purification, cleaning the heart. So that is bhajana kriya, doing things like cleaning the temple, and of course also chanting and all the other activities. But it's important for us to be engaged in bhajana kriya, bhajana, doing bhajan service for Krishna. Now, in personalists, Mayavadis, they also do karma yoga. They speak about karma yoga, to do some karma yoga, you know, and basically it's not really yoga, but it's, it's more voluntary service, you know. You want to do some voluntary service, they'll ask you to peel the potatoes, wash the floor, something like that. They have a different purpose in mind. But in Krishna consciousness, we're cultivating bhakti, devotion for, for the Lord. We want to be properly engaged in His service. Everything we're doing is for Him, for His pleasure. The impersonal, you, you go to a, you go to somewhere like some yoga ashram and there may be they may speak about karma yoga. You want to do some, but who are you doing it for? Are yeah, we doing it for the for the, the that one the, the 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 oneness? You know, to become one with the oneness, enter into that light, something like that. It, it's impersonal, but everything we do in Krishna consciousness is for Krishna. We're doing it for Krishna. Our chanting is for the pleasure of Krishna. Devotion is, can be performed in the modes of nature. There is devotional service in ignorance, in passion, in goodness, 
and there is pure devotion of servants. This is described in the third canto, Kapila Shiksha, Srimad Bhagavatam. So, devotion, it's, it's not the devotional services modes, it's us. We're in the modes. And that's why we speak about devotional service and passion. We are in passion or we are in ignorance. Devotional service itself is pure and transcendental, but we are not. We're not always so pure and so transcendental. And sometimes people may come, they may even come to do the arti or they go to the kitchen to cook for the deities and they're in a bad mood and they didn't take a bath, they didn't put on clean cloth, they haven't even got any tea like, oh, why I have to do the arti? <laughs> do something, you know, the grudging mood. Why they always ask me to cook and they you start throwing things around and cutting, you know, like this angry, angry mood. So that's devotional service in ignorance. And devotional service in passion, you're doing it to get name and fame. I'm a great devotee. <laughs> Look at me, I'm here at the RT every day, singing and dancing. I must be a nitya siddha. <laughs> so, you know, the mode of passion comes, you know, desire for fame. And the mode of goodness is also there doing, we're thinking, I will do this service at, to get rid of my bad karma. We're doing it for our own benefits. We just want to get rid of our own bad karma. We're not thinking of Krishna. We're not doing it for Krishna. We're doing it for ourselves to get rid of our bad karma. That is not the mood. I mean, it's better than passion and ignorance, but still it's not pure devotion. Pure devotion is simply for the pleasure of Krishna. You do it for Krishna. We want to work. We go out and chant and dance. We go on street sankirtan for the pleasure of Krishna. We go and distribute books for the pleasure of Krishna. Everything, all of our activities, we should think this is for, I'm doing it for Krishna. We have to remember, we have to remind ourselves. Our japa in the morning, Waking up, coming to Mongol Arti, we have, we want to do it for Krishna, to please Krishna. So, Bhajana Kriya is usually, it's at that stage of Bhajana Kriya that one may be blessed with a connection with a spiritual master. And one may be accepted and given Diksha. Diksha means a process by which we destroy sinful reactions and awaken transcendental knowledge. However, we should understand that that doesn't all happen immediately at the time of initiation. It's going to take time. And how much time it will take depends on us, depends on how we perform, how we do our activities, what is our attitude, what is our endeavor, what is our consciousness. So that is Bhajana Kriya, you get Diksha and then you come to Anartha Nivriti, the big one. This is the big hurdle, the difficult one. But this is the one where usually many of us are at, <laughs> trying to get rid of the anarthas which are there in the heart, the anarthas, the things we don't want, the material desires, so different kinds of anarthas. There are anarthas due to offenses and there are they're just like there's 
offenses in worshipping the deity. There's also Vaishnav Aparad. There's also uh, Nam Aparad, Seva Aparad, Dham Aparad. <laughs> there are many places where we can commit offenses. Of course, the chanting of the holy name, if we do it properly, it can destroy all the other offenses. It can destroy the reactions to the other offenses to help us to get through the artists. Chanting of the holy name it said even one time pure chanting of the holy name can destroy unlimited amount of reactions. We have to understand this is no mythology, it's a fact. But pure chant of the holy name. You have to chant the holy name without offense, without even it shouldn't even be namas, it should be shudhana. If it's just simply nama parad, then you're not going to get the, that effect. And if it's nama Nam chanting at the level of Nam Abbas, the shadow of the name, can bring you to liberation. But Shuddha Nam can give you Krishna Prem, love of God. And that's the goal. So Anartha Navriti is a big challenge to get through. Nasta Praesh Abhadreshu. Nityam Bhagavata Seva Bhagavati Putma Shloke by regularly hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and rendering service to the pure devotees. All that is inauspicious in the heart can be eradicated almost to nil. Almost to nil means you need to take that association. You need some very powerful association to remove the final trace of anartas from the heart. It's important. After anartha, Riti, then comes Nishta, where you become steady in devotional service. You you become steady that nobody has to wake you up for Mongol Arti. You don't have a struggle with your mind to chant your rounds. You're happy to sit and chant every day. And we're happy to take part in all the activities of Krishna consciousness. It's, it's not a battle anymore. Once you come to Nishta, you have that faith. Even the prasada may be very simple. You think, oh, prasada, how oh, nice, nice kitchery, oh, wonderful. Or you come to the kirtan and somebody's playing the madanga, play it very well. Nobody plays the kartals right. And they're not seeing you in time, do you think? Kirtan, so nice. <laughs> We're happy just to have the, even though it may not be the best, but devotees, that's very special. So that kind of nishta. And the deities may just be pictures, but you think, oh, an altar, beautiful. Oh, the deities are there. Just a photo. But, Deities, we can see Krishna in the picture. Oh, that is Nishta. We, we have we've come to that level, feeling more appreciation for these things. Even though the element may not be so good, but because the activities are there in a basic manner, so we appreciate that. You appreciate that, that all oh, so nice devotees. And that nishta goes on 
Teruchi developed the taste. The taste, not just simply tasting prasadam, but tasting the holy name and a taste for hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. We want to hear the topics of Krishna, the glories of the Lord. We want to help to develop that that taste, that ruchi, that taste. The uh, Rupa Goswami describes that no one knows how much nectar there is in these two syllables, Krishna. When I chant the holy name, I wish that I had many tongues to chant the holy name. One tongue is not enough. I want to have hundreds of tongues so I can chant the holy name. And when the holy name enters my ears, just having two ears is not enough. I should have many ears so that I can relish the sound of the holy name. When the holy name enters into my heart, then it conquers the activities of the mind and my senses become inert. That is ruchi. They have that kind of taste that you want. You think, Lord Brahma, he's so lucky. He's got four faces. He's got four tongues, eight ears. He's so lucky. But even more better than Lord Brahma is a Anantashesha. How many tongues does Anantashesha got? A thousand tongues or <laughs> so many years. So like that, we were thinking, oh, I'm so unfortunate. I have, what can I chant with one tongue? What can I hear with two ears? We want so much to relish the taste of the holy name. So then, then there's Ruchi, and Ruchi then goes on to Asakti, where one is completely indifferent to all kinds of material situations. <laughs> Don't even think about who's winning the World Cup, or, <laughs> or who's, what's the result of the politics the political election or the stock market or any of these things, you know, you just fully absorb consciousness is fully tuned in to thought of Krishna. So asakti leads into bhava. Bhava is the seat of prema. So bhava and prema, those are the, the topmost, that is the goal of devotional service, to come to that level, to develop the ecstasy and love for Krishna, to perform devotional service in ecstasy and in love of God. The bhava and prema are way at the top and we have to go through these different stages to get there. So we have to know how to get through these different stages, how to get of all these different anartas, how to develop our consciousness of Krishna. So in this way you can see it is it's very amazing is it And you can, like this, you can see the mythology behind the system of bhakti yoga. It's not whimsical. Oh yeah, yeah. If you want, you could do the. You know, you know it's very clear what we have to do, and then from this you come to that. So we have to understand this process to engage yourself in. In this case, Sutta Goswami described these different stages in the uh, 
Bhagavatam in the second chapter. And he describes it we free the modes of passion and ignorance. You see, this is another aspect of Tanavriti. Get rid of the passion and ignorance and become established in goodness. And then good that is the love. Brahmana is a symbol of the mode of goodness. But Brahmana is fact on Brahmana Vaishnava. Vaishnava is transcendental. Brahmana is the interior world. Vaishnava is transcendental. Srila Prabhupada often used to say to us that to be Vaishnava is not very easy thing. It's, it's, it's up there. It's difficult to get through these different stages to come to that transcendental level where there's no more passion or ignorance and where we're not just simply sometimes in the mode of goodness, but we've actually transcended the mode of goodness and come to the level of pure goodness, the Vasudev, that level of Vasudev, transcendental consciousness. We want to come to that position. That is Vaishnava. So we have to go through an Artanavriti to come up there to this level of pure goodness. Thus establish evam prasana manaso bhavada bhakti yogata bhagavat tattva vigyana mukta sangha shaja. Thus established in the mode of goodness, the man rejuvenating from, ma from material association gains liberation and comes to know scientifically the personality of God. So this is coming to perfection when you come to that level. We must know about Krishna. It's not that we, we just simply chant Krishna's name. Who is Krishna? Oh, I don't know, you know. We, we must know. We must understand who is Krishna, what were his qualities, what did he do. Why are we chanting his name? We have to understand the theology behind this process, the principles behind this process of bhakti yoga. And in this way, we can go on nicely to, to achieve this goal. And is it possible in this life? It, it should be. It should be possible. We have to ever for that. We have to try. How will we know? Well, time of death will know. <laughs> That's the final exam, right? The final test comes at the end of life. How much we can remember Krishna. How we've trained our mind to fix on Krishna. So that's what it's all about. We're preparing ourselves for that. Some people have the art of living. Janani Vas Prabhu, our famous Pujari in Mayapur, always said, ours is the art of dying. <laughs> How to die? Maharaj Parikshit came to get instruction. How to die? How to prepare for death? So, all of us, we're all dying every moment. Right? We're dying. It's the nature of this material body dying. We're, we have to know how to prepare for that for leaving this world. So that is bhakti yoga. That you have to hear, chant and remember Krishna in this way. This bhajana kriya. We do bhajana kriya. Hear, chant and remember Krishna. And in this way we can prepare ourselves. And you go on doing this activity, 
throughout our life, then at the end of life, it's not difficult to give up the body. And we're serving Krishna here, we we'll go on and serve Krishna some other place. That's the result of serving Krishna. You give your life to Krishna here in this life, next life you'll have the opportunity to go on serving Krishna. Maybe here, maybe in the spiritual world. It's up to Krishna. We don't demand, oh, I have to go back to God. We don't mind. Narayana Parasarve Nakutas Chinya Vibhyate Swarga Apavarga Narakesh Vapito Yatadash. All the same for devotee. Heaven and hell and liberation. No difference if we are in Krishna consciousness. Wherever we go, doesn't make any. Wherever we go, we chant and dance, we speak about Krishna, we only eat prasada. <laughs> the same lifestyle wherever we go doesn't change. So, Swarga Apavarga Narakesh, it's the same. Whether you're in heaven or hell, we don't mind. But hell becomes heaven if Krishna is there. If Krishna, if you're in Krishna consciousness. And heaven becomes like hell if you're not in Krishna consciousness. So we have to be confident of this Krishna conscious process. How we are so fortunate that we have come in this into contact with this process, that there are 8,400,000 species of life and only 4 lakh species are human species. And of the 4 lakh human species, only a few have the association of devotees. So it's very special. We're very fortunate to have this opportunity to associate with the group. <coughs> now we want to take advantage to make the best. Prabhupada said, make the best of a bad bargain. The material body is the bad bargain. Make the best and use it in Krishna's service. All right, any questions? Any comments or questions? As you said in the lecture that uh, lamentation and beauty are the same, they are not different from each other. Which ones? Lamentation and beauty of the picture of the Lord and Oh, lamination. Oh, oh. At our youth center, we have lamination. But I am uh, not able to appreciate that. Uh, what I uh, what, what I appreciate here or Radha Vunda is uh, I feel like that, uh, oh, Radha Vunda is here only. Uh, where we where did it go? It's a hospital function. Let it be. I, uh, maybe I can do one of them. You're saying you don't have the same faith in the laminated pictures. Yeah. You, you don't feel the presence of Krishna yeah. in the laminated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, like we say, it takes time. You have to come to that, Ruchi. You have to come to that level. You haven't got through an art and Navriti yet. <laughs> I don't know, even if you've come to Bhajana Kriya, I don't know how far you've come, you know, the line. But you want to appreciate the laminated, how Krishna is there in the picture, we have to have more ruchi. We have to come up there, we have to get through all of these things, then you can see these things. So, that's what's required, you have to go on, you have to work harder. Do more chanting, you have to do more service, you have to get diksha, 
you have to get through an Artana Vritti. <laughs> then you will know. Okay? You ready? <laughs> <laughs> As you said today that uh, uh, you made us realize how important the human form of life is and it is even rarest to have a separation of emotion. But uh, somewhere we have kind of insecurity. Materialistic people also have their losing of wealth. So we also, I personally have that insecurity of losing association of devotees because after going from here, I have to associate with my devotees in colleges and all that. So, given that uh, uh, it is uh, rarest and I have been fortunate to be here as an association, how to make best use of it and make sure that uh, I should activate it more? Yes, now that you're here, make the best use of your time here by absorbing yourself in all the activities, taking part in all the programs and hearing carefully and inquiring from the do devotees. So this is how we take part, this is how we benefit, that whatever you do here is all going in your spiritual bank account. The spiritual bank account is not like the material bank account, you know. Material bank account, it's always going down, you know. You put some money in, but it always goes down. But the spiritual bank account, whatever you put in there, will stay in there. Whatever bhakti, whatever devotion you've done during these days here, that's there in your spiritual bank account. And the, the, you can go on adding to that more and more. The more you engage in the devotional activities, the more we build up our bank account. So you take advantage of this program by taking full part in everything, by hearing with rapt attention and by putting questions and by ch joining in the kirtan with enthusiasm as you were all doing tonight, chanting and dancing was wonderful, just very nice, very amazing, very nice to see all of you young people chanting and dancing so ecstatically. We were blessed, of course, with Sumitra Krishna Prabhu, the temple president of Chennai, leading the kirtan for us. That was a special mercy from him. Actually, he he just is leaving tomorrow morning. He's going to Mayapur because his daughter's getting married in Mayapur. But he's the temple president of Chennai, very senior man. By Krishna's arrangement, he came here today, led a nice kirtan, and you were all in ecstasy. And the Bengali ladies were also in ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> they were all <laughs> So, so nice. So you take part in all these activities, you know. You don't want to miss anything, right? It, you, even you may feel a little tired, you know, but hang in there, hold on, you know. It's very, it, it's a limited time, but, you know, try to take advantage, to hear carefully. Some people are taking notes, some people, it's, you know, just want, you can hear, it's okay, it's up to you. If you like to take notes also, that can be done. But the idea is participation that participation in all the activities, that's important. And that way you'll have memories, you'll remember. Even five years later, you're remembering, oh yeah, I went to Newtown, we had a five-day program there. You'll remember, the memories are there, it's all going in the heart. And in the future, it will be there, you'll remember what happened, what took place. So, that's how you take advantage. 
But some people, like some people, they go to the Holy Dham. They go to the Holy Dham. What do they do? They just go to the Lloyd Bazaar and they shop, you know. They don't go to the program. They don't sit in here classes. They never join in the kirtan. They don't go out on parikram. And they just go to Lloyd Bazaar and buy some sweets and sit, you know. And then like that, you know, they don't really get the the real benefit of the association coming in the Holy Dham. This is also the Holy Dham. This is the Holy Dham, this place here. There's no sinful activities going on here. The Lord is here. This, the, 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 these two merciful lords have manifested here to bless all of us and to give their mercy. So this is the Holy Dham. Just being here with the devotees and the cows and Gornita. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, well, you can improve your chanting by more chanting. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. So more chanting is always good. Don't ever think I've done enough. <laughs> I've finished my rounds. No, can never, can never get enough chanting. Always try to do more chanting. So that's, that should be one mood. But the Mood, of course, of chanting is O Supreme Lord Krishna, O Supreme Energy of the Lord. Please engage me in your service. Please accept me. Please give me the strength to serve you. So that kind of mood. It, it's, it's a prayer. It's a prayer, but at the same time, it's an answer to our prayer. Because by chanting, we are being engaged in Krishna's service. So it's both a prayer and it's the answer to the prayer. So we're calling the Lord, he's a person and he can hear us. So we want to utter his name with love. Just like if you go to Sachinanda and Swami's Kirtan, he'll maybe tell you, chant from the heart, from the heart. You know, he wants feel from the heart. The feeling of the heart. Don't just, it's not just only lips, but you must chant from the heart. The genuine feeling that I'm calling to Krishna. And we want, you know, someone says your name, you know, you can say your, we can say your, you know, some, hey, hey um, Sunil, Sunil. You, know, you can say it nastily, Sunil. <laughs> you know, there are many different ways in which you can say people's name. So similarly, when we say Krishna, we can say Krishna's name with feeling and we can say it with longing. If you listen to Prabhupada chanting, Prabhupada, it's, it's, it's very longing. It's like calling to Krishna, longing for Krishna, calling. So think like that, you know, that we're addressing Krishna. How would you like to be addressed? How would you like someone to say your name? And then think how to say Krishna's name with feeling. That he's a person and he can hear. Okay, this will. Maharaj, yesterday uh, was told, uh, probably told in the past that Krishna wants us uh, to be happily situated in devotional service. So, uh, so I have one question. In, so, uh, in practicing some of the devotional practices, uh, many times uh, some of us uh, may get difficulty in following some of them. Just like in my case, uh, waking up early in the morning 
the rest of the written problem. So, isn't it like uh, we should uh, just uh, follow whatever we can easily follow the devotional practices and just carry on, carry on happily? Uh, <laughs> 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 yes, well, in the beginning, it's all right. Yes, I mean, you're not yet initiated, I assume, right? No, right. So in the beginning, yeah, it, it, it is like that, that we encourage you, you know? Yeah, yeah, do what you can in the beginning. You're not able to, you know, some people, some people do need more sleep. Some people have, you know, it's difficult. They're not regulated, as I said, you know, most people, sleep late and get up late. We're different, you know. <laughs> so it takes a little while to adjust to these things. But, you know, we don't say you have to do that. It's not a regulative principle. You know, when we take initiation, we don't say you have to get up at four o'clock, by four o'clock. That's not one of the principles. Although Prabhupada did write about this often in letters, he would write to devotees and he would request them, please make sure you get up by 4 a.m. in the morning. By 4 a.m. he probably liked us to be up. He said, uh, you know, ordinary people, they sleep till 6 o'clock in the morning. He said, but devote as devotees, of course, Prabhupada was addressing people who are full-time devotees. So somebody who is not full-time, in devotional service, then it will be difficult, maybe difficult for them to adjust, you know. Some people work on shifts, they're working at night. Sometimes, of course, people have children as well. Sometimes you get married, you have children, children cry at night, you have to get up and take care of them and things like that. There's a, many other reasons why people cannot wake up so early in the morning. But it's desirable. We have to understand that, that this is a good thing, that if we can gradually come to that, then, you know, just like sometimes people smoke cigarettes. There was one time there was this one man coming to the move. He, he couldn't give up smoking cigarettes. So the temple president arranged, he said, I, he said, I don't mind, you can, you just go every night, you go and smoke your cigarette if you want, go and smoke every night, and then, you know, but don't tell other devotees, you know. <laughs> so he allowed them, you know, just because he couldn't give up smoking cigarette. So that was in the beginning, you know, in the beginning, you would go and smoke a cigarette, but gradually he gave it up. He gave it up, gradually. And similarly, people get very attached to a cup of tea. You know, some people told me, I cannot get up in the morning without a cup of tea. <laughs> That's a common thing in India, I think. Quite common. Uh, so, you know, okay, you know, you know, doesn't bar you from Krishna consciousness. We don't say, oh, no, then you can't be a devotee. You know? <laughs> no, of course, yeah, okay, okay. You take, you're, you're drinking a cup of tea, all right, all right. You know, but gradually you have to understand this is not such, such a good thing. And I don't really need this tea. I can live without it. I'm not going to die without my tea. So you put, you, you get rid of it. So similarly, you, you cannot gradually come to adjust your schedule so that you can wake up earlier in the morning. Usually people can't get up in the morning because they sleep so late at night. And, you know, you're accustomed to sleep late at night. All right. So you have to gradually adjust that habit. Sometimes, like, you know, we have Janmashtami. We stay up late on Janmashtami. We got fast until midnight. And so we're very late. And so... And then the next morning is Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja. We have to be up. So you only get a couple of hours to, to rest. You have to get up the next morning. And so that day you're really tired, you know. 
you're really in the afternoon by the time that you get everything finished the afternoon you're 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 ready to take a to take have a have a good sleep so you, you just wait until you know earlier in the evening and then you take rest about maybe at nine o'clock or something at night and you take rest at nine o'clock and then you could sleep you know you're not going to sleep many more hours than anybody else most people will sleep like six or seven or eight hours you know okay so then you get up but you try to you just make arrangements so that you're more tired earlier in the evening and then you take rest earlier, and then your body will wake up earlier. You can wake up. You can do it. it. You know, one thing is put your alarm clock a little out of your reach. <laughs> <laughs> so that you have to get up to turn off your alarm clock. It, it's really based on desire. You have to have the desire to want to do these things, you know. Every, many other people, are, they do it. You know, why can't I do it? So we, we just have to focus on cultivating that desire that I'm going to do this. It, it's, it's just a matter of training, practice, by practice and detachment. Okay, any other question? Yes, Prabhu? Well, yes, it's true that we can never know everything about Krishna because Krishna is unlimited. As soon as you think you know everything, then Krishna expands himself more. <laughs> and then you, you, you learn more about Krishna, and then Krishna expands himself further. And he's continually expanding himself. And Ananta Shesha has been describing the glories of Lord Krishna since time immemorial. With all of his 1,000 mouths, he's describing the glories of Krishna. So what hope do we have of ever knowing Krishna in full? But if you know the holy name of Krishna, the holy name of Krishna is Krishna in full. Everything is there in the holy name because the holy name is not different from Krishna. And you said you were chanting the name. So you just simply concentrate on hearing the holy name and you will know Krishna in full. Because you know the holy name, you're associating with the holy name. Nam Chintamani Krishna, Purna Shudo Nechimokto, Binat Nam Namanam. The holy name is Purna, it's complete. Everything is there in the name. The form, the qualities, the pastime, it's all there in Nam. Nam, Guna, Rup, Lila, all, all included within the holy name. So you're not missing anything. You just concentrate on chanting. Yes, any other question? Okay, maybe, yes, okay, last question. You have a question? Last question, you said that uh, we are careless, that we need the of fire. So how we can become careful before the Well, we become careful when we're with devotees. We're more careful being in the association of devotees. 
will be more conscious what we're doing because others are watching you, right? They're watching you, they see what you're doing, they'll tell you, hey Prabhu, come on, what are you doing? You can't do that. Right? So having the association of devotees will help us to be more careful. And remembering Krishna, you chant also, Krishna says, you know, from the heart he will give instructions. So the more we're thinking of Krishna, the more Krishna reciprocates and guides us and gives us direction to take care. Krishna says, Kunti apriti janihi nami bhakta pranashi. The devotee won't perish. But you have to be devotee. You have to devote yourself to Krishna. Then Krishna will help. He will take care. He will guide you. Give you the intelligence so that no harm comes to you. So this is it. Just become Krishna conscious. You'll be safe. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki. Go back to Vrinda ki. So thank you for all of your association. And we look forward to seeing you in Danbad or wherever. <laughs> Come to me. You can all come to China. Thank you.